let's just uh, stand and look to the Lord this morning. Any prayer requests before we begin uh, as we look to the Lord this morning? You all prayed up? Pray. Unspoken. Uh, unspoken, yes. All right, let's all bow. Here. Heavenly Father, as we come before thee this morning, we thank you, Lord, that we can approach thee, Lord, through, through that precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you'd meet every need, Lord, even if they're unspoken or whoever they may be on thy footstool. Now, Lord, we commit the service in your hand. In the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. You can be seated this morning. I'm going to have Brother Paul come lead us into song service. Good morning. Good to see everyone out this morning. When I look around and see all the good things He's done for me, I know I'm unworthy of them all. For His blessing He freely gives, I owe my life. To him I've got so much to thank him for. Yes, I've got so much to thank. Could do number uh, 561 in the blue book here. <coughs> Stay 
Mercy rewrote my life. Mercy rewrote my life. I should have fallen my soul. If we could do uh, 195 in the red book here.
Praise the Lord. Jesus, wonderful. Look what he's done for me. I just appreciate him so much. My mind always goes back when I was 14. And I laid in the top bunk in a small bedroom with my brother. I asked God to forgive my sins. And I had no reason for doing that. I had no teaching. I had no understanding. And when I went in two or three little churches, four years later, I heard a story. Blood was shed for me. For the forgiveness of my sins. Amen. A person called Jesus Christ had come to this earth 
and had went all the way to the cross, and he shed his blood for me. And I began to call on God, and I didn't know what was in my heart. I thought it was praying with all my heart, and I still give him parts of my heart so many years later. But I called on him with all my heart, and he came, and he met me, and he ministered to me. And I'm just saying that because I want to tell you a story here in a minute if I can ever get there. <laughs> it's pretty good to talk about Jesus. Yes. Uh, everybody knows I'm a grave digger. And I dug a grave this week. In an old cemetery that I'd never been before. And we dug down, and there was the foundation of an old church. And I had to cut right down through that foundation. Because that's not too hard because I'm quick. But we did that. And the man that I buried, he's not buried on that foundation. I cut it out. He was a minister of a denomination. He was a high up in the ranks of a university teaching religious studies. He was an advocate for gay rights and all that stuff. And when you consider the world of religion, what is our foundation? What are we built upon? And I was so glad that I didn't go the path that that man went, advocating for open sin. As it was in the days of Noah, and as it was in the days of Lot. And the world don't know where they're going. But when I was 14, something was working. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Yes. And a little bit later, I heard that wonderful story, and it changed my life. And it's just as real, or more real to me today, and I just love it. Praise God. Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 462 in the blue book. Draw nigh. To God and He'll draw nigh to you. Just read His word, pray to you, pray through. Don't be. Come to you. Run 
Do you have the number, Nora? Okay. <coughs> 481. Brother uh, Elijah, do you have a song this morning? One, okay, sorry, 107 in the red.
Elijah, do you have a song? Yeah. There's a white house on the hillside that overwatch what I see oh when I'm tossed it gives a life hope oh, that I might see and the light that shines in darkness
China, would you have a song this morning?
For probably about the last six months or so, I've been feeling as if I'm falling away. Sorry. I'm just so amazed that even though that I felt like I could not hold on or I was struggling, he held on to me and even though I thought I wasn't worthy anymore. He was still looking after me, not only giving us what, our, what we need, but surpassing it. And still loving us through it all. Still yes. loving me through it all, even though I felt like I was really falling away. And I wasn't even sharing this stuff with my husband. I was becoming bitter and angrier from day by day. His love is amazing. Yes. yes. And I'm thankful that he saved me a long time yes. ago. Amen. Amen. And even when we fail, his love is strong enough Amen. to keep us going. Yes. And that blood was covered from that day and that day forward. Yes. And I'm thankful. Yes. And I just want to praise him. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. Oh, thank you, Lord. I'd like to praise the Lord this morning, too. And uh, I don't know if this is going to come out right, but uh, when Brother Mims came and he told us about going into your prayer closet, well, I always felt I struggled with my prayer life, and I always had to try to pray a lot of words and you know, really mean it. Like in my heart, I really wanted to. But when he said, "Then you go in your prayer closet, and after you pray, what you have to pray, that you're silent." And I've been doing that. And if you're not doing it, I encourage you to do it, yeah. because I want the Lord to speak to me. And there's days I go there, and I may fall asleep, but there's days I go there, and He speaks to me. Yeah. And this morning, I wasn't even there very long, and. The Lord spoke to me about how we always say that we're not worthy. And myself, I'm not worthy, but I am worthy because of what Jesus did. He shed his blood. And I always felt that whenever I said I wasn't worthy, that gave Satan a way to attack me and say, you're not worthy. And we believe it, you know, and it really brings us down. And I believe we should be joyful. And I'm joyful this morning, and I have such a peace in my soul because of what he's done for me, and he does speak to me. And I want him to speak to me, and I go expecting him to speak to me. And this morning, I believe he spoke to me. And I thought, you know, Lord, I'd like you to speak to me, even not just in this quiet time. Yeah. And I felt led to read in Mark 2, and it's where Jesus is all surrounded by people, and everything's going on, and yet the Lord spoke to him. And he heard. And I believe he, we, the same thing happens to us. I know it's happened to me, but I like to be in tune. And that's my prayer that I'm always in tune, that he speaks to me and I hear and I obey. And I know a lot of people, you can tell them the truth and eh, you know, it doesn't matter. I can remember one time, not too long ago, my niece really likes tattoos and I don't like them. I've always told her I didn't like them, but I never told her why I didn't like them. But I told my sister and brother-in-law, her parents, that in Leviticus it says that it's an abomination to God. He hates it. And I'm not saying anything, anybody's got tattoos, people get them and they don't even realize at the time or anything, but like there's a reason why I don't agree with everything. And it's because of God's word. And I believe that I want to be even more that way. And uh, I'm just thankful this morning. I, like I am amazed that it's a beautiful song that Janice sang. It's beautiful words, but it's really beautiful because it's really reality to us. And I'm really thankful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, seeing all these children this morning really touches my heart. And last week we were discussing about how like this time and age it's really difficult for young people in their walk of God. And I, I, uh, I'm just saying that we should pray for these young ones and keep them in our hearts. Yes. Especially that Sophie is pregnant and so is Jana. And just seeing this new family, multi-sweet children. 
Just a second again. I was just going to get Brother York to. I'll try, I'll try not to take too long. And the Lord is so good to us. He's, he's always there whenever we run into a problem and there's so many things that we we do face in in life as I, I think of Peter the Apostle Peter and Jesus said to him one time he said Peter Satan has desired you that he might sift you is wheat and he's not the only one that Satan desires he desires any one of us that he might sift us as wheat but Jesus said I I have prayed for you that your faith fail not and that's where he wants to work on us, is to cause our faith to fail. I had that experience last winter for a long while, that Satan was trying to destroy my faith. When he told me that there is no God, you don't believe in God, it was a struggle, but this course tells it all. He's always there for me. There
I had an experience with, with the Lord a few days ago. I had a vision in, in my spirit, a panoramic view of the plan of God from Genesis to Revelation. And, and he made it so clear to me that what it's really all about is not about our living here on this earth so much. It's on the eternity, things that are eternal. And uh, like Paul said in Colossians, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God and set not your affections on the things of this world because it's all vanity. It's every bit vanity. And uh, the reason he saved us was to have a fellowship with us. He reconciled us back to himself. That's what it's all about. It's not how much we can accomplish here in this life. It's what eternity holds for us. And you say, well, what does that do for you, Brother York? It just brought a, a peace and, a, and an assurance and a real comfort to me like I haven't had for a long time. So now I'm waiting for that day. Praise the Lord when I should go to be with him. Praise the Lord. God bless you. spirit here this morning and I'm uh, thankful for all the testimonies this morning the Lord is so good and uh, when that will change the service to brother Fred if you'd all stand for a minute please
Well, praise the Lord. The Lord is wonderful. The, the earth didn't end yesterday, as the sum was predicted on the Heavenly Father, as we come to this part of the service, Lord, we thank the Lord that we can be in a country, Lord, where that we can, Lord, look, yeah, assemble the, ourselves together, Lord, in peace. But, Lord, as we would look in your word, I just pray, Lord, use this vessel of clay as you would see fit. We ask it now in that precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Can we see it this morning? If you got your Bibles with you this morning, I want to turn to Matthew chapter 16. Maybe continuing on a little bit from what we looked at last week. One of the laws of God is sowing and reaping. And God expects out of every one of us an increase. And that increase applies to the ministry as well as to the believer. As it's been noted before, where the scripture declares, as I think it's in Matthew 10, chapter 10, verse 41, he that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet receives a prophet reward. He that receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man receives a righteous man's reward. Yes, the prophet, or yes, the righteous man. Now, the righteous man is not just implying just any ordinary righteous man, he's talking about the ministry. And so, therefore, whatever God gives that ministry, the revelation of the Word of God, God gives to him. Also, the believer that sees it the same, God holds no difference. You have still the same reward, praise the Lord. So, he's not a respective person in that manner. But I'm thankful that the Lord is that way. Uh, brings back to Deuteronomy chapter 29, I believe around 29. The secret things of God belongs to him. But things that are revealed belongs to you and I. Because yeah. He delivered it in your and my heart to carry. He didn't want us to carry a Bible just because we're carrying a book. He wants it on the table, fleshly, of our hearts. We're not going to carry a physical Bible when we go to glory. But we will carry the Word of God that He's given to each and every one of us. So praise the Lord. But that's to start with. Uh, the reason I want to go to Peter this morning in the 16th chapter, and verse 17, starting from there, and Jesus said unto him, Blessed are thou, Simon Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. Now Peter said, Jesus had asked him, Who am I? And Peter says, Thou art the Son, the Christ, the Son, the Christ, the Christ, the Son of the Living God. Yes. In Matthew chapter 16, what did I say? Yeah, it's not in Peter. I was thinking about Peter. All right. Don't mind me, I didn't sleep too well last night. I should have not ate as late as I did, and sometimes you're not fully awake. But the so Jesus is saying, Simon Peter. Flesh and blood doesn't reveal this to you. It was a precursor of how God would reveal things to his children. He says, as not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. He's the revealer. We all have one Father. All have one Spirit. 
but the fall that, that you and I will never see. Because he fills the whole universe. The universe is in him. And the universe being in him, what kind of pair of eyes would you have to see the whole universe? We have a hard time seeing the moon here on this planet Earth. So he that is everywhere present, nowhere absent, is that great eternal spirit. And he can take his spirit and gives it to every one of us. That's why we all have one Father. But he wants to redeem you and I through Jesus Christ. Because it's the Father's plan to redeem you and I. Because he that has no body, no physical body, cannot die. There's nowhere that I find in the Bible where the great eternal spirit died. But Jesus, his only begotten son that he brought on earth, did die. He died at Calvary. He was not a robot. He had a mind. He said, Father, not my will, but thine be done. That shows there was a mind in that vessel of clay. But he was going to be the very representation of all the characteristics and the attribute of our great heavenly father. There's two minds invo involved, but there's one spirit. Praise the Lord. Didn't he say one day, Jesus say, Father, make them one as we are one. So where do you want to carry that oneness? All right. But now as Peter said that Jesus, thou art the Christ. The Christ means the anointed one. The son of the living God. If you're a son, you had a beginning. Jesus came on earth 2,000 years ago. Yes, it was in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. So you and I were in the mind of God before the foundation of the world, but you and I didn't exist till the Word of God brought us here into existence in our time. So I'm thankful for the revelation God has opened up. It was lost after the first church age. But God has restored it here back at the end. So now, as he says here, thou art Peter, I will build my church upon, thou I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what was he going to build it upon? He was going to build it upon divine revelation, not by divine education. Education is fine, but if we ever know anything of the Word of God, it takes the Spirit of God to make it real in our bosom and in our heart. It's not an intellectual understanding, it's a reality. To give us an example. I know I've used this before, but if I talk to a person that maybe going to high school or elementary school, and I tell them, there's power in that electrical outlet. You touch that, you get shocked. He has an intellectual under, understanding. But the minute he touched that thing, you don't have to tell him a word. It's alive. So is God. He's alive. Yeah. He can be real. No, he won't shock you, so don't get scared that way. But he's real. Yeah. And he wants to redeem you and I. And as we look in the parables, there's a growth as walking with the Lord. To begin with, we're, when the Lord picked us up, we were babes in Christ. Sometimes we think, now excuse, I don't mean to, to fall on teenagers, but you don't know everything. When the Lord called you, you think you do, but you don't. The more as we walk with the Lord, the more we understand we don't know very much. So we are babes in Christ, but at least there's a start. There's a draw. There's a pull. There's something somewhere. In, it sets a hunger for to know the God that created you. He wants to speak to you. Not with visible lips, but sometimes it comes in so real 
as if, as if someone had spoken to you, and it makes that word alive. Yeah. I remember before I was saved, there was this brother claiming to be a Christian, and there was a Jehovah Witness, and they were arguing back and forth, and said, well, who's right? Well, I said, I don't know. I don't even have a Bible. Well, then when I got a, one of them, the Jehovah Witnesses got me a Bible, started reading it, it was like reading the phone book. But when God saved me, it was not like reading, the Bible was not like reading the phone book. There became a hunger. And he promised that he said when you would receive the Holy Spirit, he'll show, take the things of mine and show to you that's concerning your and my life what we need to do. But he also said he'll show you things to come, not just the past. And that applies even at the end time. Now the things at the end time are not going to be concerning your basic salvation. God has in his word, the book of Daniel, things in Isaiah, and especially the book of Revelation, it's all been written. But all has not been revealed. We're not going to the rapture and say, well, Lord, I thought you wanted to reveal everything. He will in his due course and time. And how do we know we're living at the end time? One day before Jesus, before he left his disciples, they wanted to know everything of what's going on. And that's like us Gentiles too. We want to know everything yesterday, not just today. And he's, he more or less burst their bubble. He says, it's not for you to know the time or the seasons concerning those things. He told that to them back here in that first church age. They didn't, they didn't brood and say, well, you don't like us. You should have told us. No. Even if he'd have told them, history and events would have never took place. They couldn't even relate to what he wanted to tell them. How would Peter know what a cruise missile is? How would Peter know what, that there would be a, a, a great empire called the United States of America. It didn't exist back then. So it's not for them to know, but because he said that, and he had spoke to them about things coming to the time of the end, how things would be, but he never expounded the details, but just to let them know and to give a framework that there was things going to be God was going to do at the end times somewheres. But the time and the season, which means centuries and decades in today's language. Centuries and decades somewhere would become relevant when time and history has progressed far enough that now when he would open this up, it would have a meaning. And we know you just don't things out of the air and then, oh, it means this and it means that, just like they're trying to say what was trying to happen there yesterday, September 23rd. It was the new year for the Jews, but some were saying it was the end of the world and all kind of stuff. They don't know the scripture because they didn't have the spirit walking with them in their time and in their season. It's also in Matthew chapter 24, verse 32. Jesus speaks about the fig tree. When it puts forth a branch and puts forth leaves, that generation will not pass away. Now, there's all things that it would be fulfilled. And when you're looking back what he told to Peter and them, they wouldn't know the time and the season, but that time and the season would come to an end when at here we're living at the end time. And when that prophetic event took place that Israel was born in one day, that's the branch going, 
that tender branch that's being put forth. Now, till all things be fulfilled, the bride would come to a perfection. There would be a five-fold ministry, and there would be the time of the breaking of the seals to be ready to leave the planet to go into a rapture. So there's some things yet to transpire, and that's why the earth, the earth, the world couldn't end yesterday. So now, as we're standing in this in this time frame, I was not born in 1948. Well. So I was born in 1947. I was one year old. I wouldn't have known anything at one year old. But Israel was born or created in one day by UN. That was the start of that nation. It was not its full place. But Jesus said two statements. He said, when it puts forth a branch, then puts forth leaves, then you know summer is nigh. And that generation will not pass away till everything be fulfilled. Now, if there's going to be a ministry to bring the bride to perfection, the generation that's seen Israel become a nation that was 20 years old, or your World War II veterans, if time is almost passed over, that they wouldn't live here, that everything will be fulfilled till Jesus comes for the bride. But the other part, when he says, when he puts forth leaves, what does the leave mean? It means people. You read in Daniel concerning Nebuchadnezzar, how that it talks about, it gives reference to leaves as being the people. So therefore, when he's talking about, when he puts forth leaves, it would put forth more Jews in the land. In 1948, they only had a little secular piece of land. But in 1967, another prophetic event transpires. Jerusalem shall no longer be occupied by the Gentiles. That gave them more land. They can put more people, they can put forth more leaves. That generation, which is the generation at 20 year, around 20 years old, in 1967 will see everything being fulfilled. Now, when we look at 1948 being the a nation being born in one day, it will only go one generation. That's all it can go, because that's what he said. That means centuries, there would be no more centuries. It's over. You have dropped from being centuries now into decades going forth. All right. So you and I are living in the Lydiocene church age. Yes, in every period of time, if you want to, we can look at what it was in the Ephesian church age or Sardin Sardius church age, Pergamos, or, but I'm more concerned with the one with Lydiocene. That's the age I'm living in. But every part, if you want to look at a generation, not don't pick a year, but it's looking in terms of the growth, how God deals with, he brings in babes, he takes them under tutorship, and once they're finished being tutored, then they have to go forth. All right? So going forth, we're going to look at some things here this morning that I want to bring into. And Brother Ray touched uh, some things uh, a couple of weeks ago that I found interesting. And that's in John chapter 12, verse 26. Now, starting at verse 24 or 23, and Jesus answered, says, The hour is come that the Son 
of man should be glorified. Verily I say unto you, except a corn of wheat falls into the ground, and dieth is abideth alone. But if it dieth, it brings forth much fruit. It brings forth an increase. And he that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Now, here's the scripture that sort of touched me at that time. If any man serve me, let him follow me. Where I am, there, uh, there shall be my servants. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now, says, where I am, there's my servant also. We can look at that from an intellectual point of view. Oh, yes, Jesus died across the calorie. We're all going to be with Jesus one day. That's not what he's pointing to. Not that side of things. We will, if we're going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, it's while we're down here on earth. In glory, we're going to rule and reign with him. We're his bride, his wife. But while down on here, we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We follow the Lord. And how do you follow the Lord? Well, okay, I've, I've read how I should be born again. I've come through that and... Uh, I know that certain things I should clean out of my life and so forth, and that's how I'm following Jesus. Yes, that is part of it, but a very minute part of it. It is a very important part. But to follow Jesus is not following Him necessarily in a time frame per se. It's to follow Jesus as He as the Father gives him revelation and understanding. So therefore, now throughout the grace age, yes, to follow Jesus is to follow Jesus for your day and your time. Look in the week of Daniel. The 144,000, they says they follow the Lamb. He's not on earth. How do they follow him? They follow him in the revelation they give them in that day when they move into that week of Daniel. 144,000 does. But here, in, let's take it in this age that we're living now. How do we follow Jesus? He says, where I am, there you may be also. So he's not looking at a physical spot. But he's looking at a point of revelation that he has come to. Now I know the denomination says, well Jesus is God, he knows everything. Excuse me, but Jesus said, of that day of that hour, no man knoweth, not even the Son. And didn't he, when he walked on earth, whatever the Father showeth me, that he speaks in the time, because God had reserved in, the great eternal spirit has reserved in his bosom, the things when it's to be revealed. Otherwise, Jesus would know when that, seventh thunder, when that seventh seal is going to be broke. But he don't. His own word says so. So Jesus, as is in glory, as, he's, as God is now dealing with the church ages. We take the Ephesian church. Jesus came and delivered the basic sal the message how to be for our salvation. And how he came and died for your and my sins. We don't have to work for it. That's applied to you. You don't work for it. By one sacrifice. Not like the Catholic Church teaches. He dies in every... 
every sacrifice of the mass in that little wafer there. The, it's just man's intelligence of looking at this, the Word of God. But once truth comes in, it destroys that picture altogether. So now as Jesus has come and he's died and he, he rose up in glory. Can you see Peter or maybe the Apostle Paul? I'm his servant. I'm following Jesus. I've got all the, the words he said and I'm, that's how I follow him. What did he use? Now remember, he's not talking about beginners. He's not talking about tutorship. He's talking about servants, ministry. Yes, it applies to the believer as well that follows that ministry, whatever God-ordained ministry he has. You had Peter, Paul, James, all those apostles that were there in the early church. But yet in that time frame, did not the apostle Paul went on the backside of the desert and it was shown things to him that Jesus never spoke about. Now did God say, well, P Paul, I'm going to reveal this to you and I won't, won't tell Jesus about it. No, where revelation comes, how does it work? The great eternal spirit that knows all things, that created all things, first is working in and through his son. He said that his plan of salvation was going to be worked through his only begotten son. So therefore, when Jesus receives the word, he don't come phys physically or in a vision of the night. Well, not in a vision of the night. He doesn't come and say, well, now, hey, Paul, this is what it's all about. He sends an angel to tell his servants to be up to date what he sees in glory. Where did you get that? In Revelation chapter 22. Jesus said, I have sent my angel to you to testify the things in a church, no, in the churches, the church ages. The things that are to be. That's how revelation came to Paul. But Paul had the right to say it came, how God taught him. Well, that's the source, the origin of it. But it is given to Christ, which now sends an angel and speaks to him. Peter, the epistles of Peter, in the, when we arrive around 90 A.D., that old apostle was on the Isle of Patmos. The book of Revelation was not even written in the days when Jesus walked. And that book of Revelation is the love letter. It is the instruction letter for the bride at the end time. Because when the time has arrived that he that readeth and understands not with your mind, but by divine revelation what's in that book, you know you're living at the end time. It was written in 96 AD, but it was meant for our day. No man could figure it out all through the grace age till the time ordained for it to be opened. Man has probed at it, had guessed at it, and found it too difficult while well, they just leave it alone. It just muddied up. Nobody knows. Now if you use it from your intellectual point of view, you will never know. God purposely hid it. Just like the things in the book of Daniel, the 12th chapter. God purposely hid some things that us at the time of the end. Enough recorded that it gives an overall profile, but to know what's in it, time have to exist and when we look back with time where the things have been revealed, how does it fit like a glove? Praise the Lord. All right. So where I am, there is my servants also. So wherever you can look at that all through this grace age, wherever the point is at, where Jesus is in a revelatory understanding, he brings his servants up to date to the same revelation where he's at at that time. Well, all right, we're going to go on.
Now here at the end time, there are things that God has really brought to our understanding. Yeah, here. Again, like I mentioned earlier, that fig tree became a nation in 1948. By the time you reach 1967, she got more land. Israel now fulfills the word that it shall put forth leaves. Yes, to the preachers that was in that generation of 1948, they had every right to say, because that's all they knew. God, revelation keeps opening, but it, it is continuing in the same revelatory path. He opens it up as he goes along. And they were believing that 1948 would be the generation. But now we know that there won't be any of that generation to minister because we know that we have but maybe 10, 20 years left, if that. We don't know. We don't know the day, the hour. But Jesus didn't say we would not know the season when it would arrive. In Matthew chapter 24, and I want to go there this morning, Matthew chapter 24. Verse 42, or verse, yes. Jesus had finished talking about the end of the, the end time when he would come again. Because prior to that, talk about, talk about, he was talking about the rapture. One shall be sleeping, one shall be taken. The other one, two working in the field, one shall be taken, one left. All that's the reason he made those two statements, to show that the rapture is universal. Not in one physical spot. Because at night, there's some sleeping in the bed. While they sleep in Japan and we're in the daytime, you're working in the field. So it's a universal picture. But then he comes down to verse 42. He says, watch, therefore. Now what's he talking about watching for? The principal doctrines of Jesus Christ? The believers should have that. The doctrines of the apostles? They should have that. Because God has restored those doctrines of the apostles. They were all scattered among the different religions. And then God used a prophet that came on the scene that took those, all those doctrines of the apostle and put them back in its place. Not in a church, forming a church system, but brought back those revelation back in the book where they belong. But when he's saying watch here, is he talking about watching those things? He's talking about watching his coming. Why? Why do I need to know things about his coming? Because in the things concerning his coming, it's going to be in some, involved with some things that bride needs to hear. She's going to need to hear what's in that book of Revelation. Because the time would have arrived that he that reads it starts to understand, not because of intelligence, because God reveals what's in that book. Not all at once, but in that generation, God now starts to open up the things in that book of Revelation. That's you'll find that in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. And, well, maybe I should read that just to show that Jesus... Th where he got it from, where did Jesus get that knowledge? The first verse in the first chapter. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, to Jesus. Not to John here, it's given to Jesus. That's what it says here. But what is it for? To show his servants, not way back in the early church, 
but his servants here at the end time. Not one servant or two servants. Servant is plural. But, they, but whatever God reveals, well, they will all see the same things. Because there's only one faith, one Lord, one baptism. And the servants which must certainly come to pass. So he's going to, the thing that the great eternal spirit gave Jesus Christ, God gave him, he's going now to show it to his servants, which must certainly come to pass. Not in thousands of years in that last generation. Now a generation of God is short. Because remember a thousand years with the Lord is as one day. And he signified it. How? how it's in other words, how did he do it to, his, to bring it to his servants? He did it by his angel that was sent to John. It was an angel that introduced Jesus' first coming. And it will be an angel that introduces Jesus' second coming. It was not an ordinary angel that introduced Jesus' first coming. It was the archangel Gabriel. And that's a pretty high order of the angelic family. He only comes when something is important and dynamic. And the time when God was now to start to open up this book of Revelation, that angelic being would come. Not people would see it, but it would be influential to open things to his servants. Now he says... He signified it by his angel unto his servant John. That's why in the last chapter of this book of Revelation, Jesus said, I have sent my angel. He didn't say, I've come and told you what these things was. I sent my angel to show you the things that are therein and to the, all the churches. All right. Who bear... Verse 2, who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, all the things that he showed. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear. That's not because of your education. Any Tom, Dick, and Harry can read it. Any Dr. Divinity can read it. But unless God is, gives the understanding and the inspiration what it is, I don't care how educated or not educated, you will never know the truth of it. Till the Spirit of God actually deals with vessels of clay to show what's in here. So blessed he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy. And those who keep the things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. For what? It's the last generation. Gener centuries ended in 1948. 1967, we're into the decade area. He's not going to reveal this thing to the bride when she's up in glory. It has to be revealed here on earth. Well, praise the Lord. So now, getting back to that scripture of John chapter 12, verse 26. Where I am, there my servants are also. And if our mind is just looking at the beginning in the Ephesian church age, you're completely out of whack in this time frame if you're, if you're looking at it in those terms. Where are the servants following Jesus today? In his revealed word as the Spirit comes. And it's that Spirit that Jesus said when he walked here on earth. When the Comforter comes... He will show you things to come. There will be a people that will know what this book of Revelation says. There are people who will know what the book of Daniel means. Ezekiel. Isaiah. Yes, there's things that was revealed in their hour, but not everything that's in those books has been opened up. But we are the generation. Somewhere God should have been opening things up. And those who see are not living in fear that the earth is going to end tomorrow. Or the rapture is going to happen next year. Or, or are we believing on blood moons? Or, or, or this 50th Jubilee and all these scarecrow revelations. That, that's through man's intelligence. 
But those who do see are not shaken when those things come around. We know there are some things yet ahead of us. Uh, I sort of got away from where I want to read, I'm looking at here. Again, in Matthew 24, verse 42, if you want to go back there again. Now, Jesus says something interesting when he walked on earth here. He says, watch. Remember, he's talking about watching his coming, because that's what he's been talking about in the previous verses. Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord does come. Well, that, that's, someone can say, well, that's a general statement. Yes, that's fine. But watch what he says next. But know if the good man of the house had known in what watch. That implies more than one watch, doesn't it? The thief would have, that the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered the house to be broken in because he would have known the time frame that he's in. Now why did Jesus say, in what watch? You find it in Luke chapter 12 now, if you want to turn there. There's a time and a season for things to come to the forefront. It would have been no use to tell the early church saying, well, hey, there's more than one watch. In Luke chapter 12, verse 36, and you yourself wait of men wait for their Lord when he will return. There's a returning of the Lord in revelatory understanding, opening up revelation again. Yes, there's a Lord's physical return, but watch what takes place in this verse. Return from the wedding is the wedding preparation. It's the way the old English said, put the word wedding. He says, and when he cometh and knocketh, he's not going to be knocking up in heaven on people's doors. But when he comes and knocketh, that he may open unto him immediately, blessed are those servants, plural, when would they be, this would be taking place. It would be a return in revelatory understanding that the Lord would be in part to the church. Here at the end, blessed those who read. All goes along with it. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, he shall gird himself and make them to sit down where? On earth. Sit down to meet and shall come and serve them. We're not going to up in glory says, well, let's all go down so I can fulfill this scripture that I can feed meat when you're down there. There are scriptures that show in concerning the Lord returning. It's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Lord shall descend with heaven with a shout. All right, when I was in the Catholic Church, they felt that the Lord be coming. And there's a great big shout and he's coming. He's there. Has nothing to do with that. The coming of the Lord has to do with a shout, which is a message. The voice of the archangel. Number two. Then the trump of God. That would be done in stages at the last generation. The time we're living in. And the best way sometimes to understand it, if you haven't come across these scriptures, is this way here. If the Queen of England was coming to Canada... She sends a message, she's coming. Is she here itself yet? Yeah, no. Then finally she does land, or in the proximity of coming. Then they have a procession with all the cars that you know she's, the voice is there saying, hey, she's here. Right? And then finally you get to see her. Well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, is the same way. The Lord is coming with a shout. Now there's divine revelation. Then there will be that voice of that archangel. 
the trump, then he's going to be here to sound it. Because when the sound of that trump, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we alive, we're going to be changing the twinkling an eye, and we'll meet him in the Lord in the air. So praise the Lord. All right, I just just thrown that in to fill it in. Now, he's, when he said in Matthew 24, watch what, he says, in what watch he would come. Well, here he talks about, in Luke, he talks about he's going to come and feed service down here. That was not in the first age. That was not during the other church ages. It's here at the end time. And to open immediately, because well, time is short. And in verse 38 it says, And if it shall come, and if he shall come in the second watch. Well, Jesus, well, you're talking about those things. There's only one watch when you're coming. No. He said, if I come in the second watch. Or in the third watch. And find them so blessed are those servants. Because they've been watching all along. Because God is restoring in three watches. And when he said in Matthew, he says, it was not, really is not, it was not needed for them to know in what watch. He says, you don't know in what watch I'm coming. But it had to be recorded there's going to be more than one. But when he talks about Luke, he's, po he's pointing here to the end time. What about if I come in the second watch? Or the third watch? Matthew chapter 25 depicts the, ninth, the 20th century. And he says, watch and therefore. When he comes, that was a preparation for people now to get back to the Word of God. Then God sent a ministry. It's Jesus didn't come down physically to feed the meat, the servants, plural, here. But he is the initiator that sent his angel to fulfill that and had to be through a human vessel. We just can't blame, block our eyes. Well, always somebody, well, he's, he's preaching a man. Somewhere God's going to send somebody to preach the word. And in that second watch, we were fed. God started opening up a lot of things that was in that book of Revelation that you and I carry right now. We don't have the A to Z of it yet. There is still yet some things to be opened up. But then, while in that second watch, that's why when we're looking at this generation, while we're being taught by Jesus, he was feeding the servants, the servants to be what? Why is he feeding servants? Well, it's nice that somebody's fed. Praise the Lord. You know. No. He's feeding them for them to be used for a work. And he has to restore the original five-fold ministry, not the men that were there, but the five type of ministries back at the end, because Ephesians chapter 4 says that he will bring forth apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the church, the edifying, and the lifting of that ministry till we all come into the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man that can be ready for a rapture. So therefore, that's why we are living now, time-wise, in that third watch. I find the same one here again. Here. So we are in the third watch. It's been a while since 1948, hasn't it? Since 1967. We've gone under tutorship. No, we didn't have to go to a school of divinity. It's a school of neology where the Spirit speaks to a person that now God can open up the Scriptures and the revelation can't be defeated. It's not just something that, oh, wow, for a while, and then, and then all of a sudden time goes on and it proves it false. Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth, uh, the four horse rider of Billy Graham. You don't hear that much more anymore. They, they didn't see their day. 
Now, I'm not disrespecting like what God had did for them for the hour, but had they been walking with the Lord, the revelation would have been steady and they would be seeing what was coming up the road. This bride has her eyes wide open. She is going to know how close we are getting to the time that that seventh seal is going to be broke. And when that ministry has gone forth, they're going to lift up the voice. And what voice are they going to be lifting up? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh for him, and if those that refuse him that spoke on earth, and their judgment would happen to them. How much more shall we escape? We is here at the end time. That turn away that him that speaks from heaven... Now, when he's talking about speaking from heaven, he's not going to be repeating the principal doctrines of Jesus Christ, nor the doctrines of the apostles, but he's going to be speaking fresh meat. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. So, what would happen if God is giving a servant somewhere some fresh meat. And around people say, well, they're looking at the person. They're not being led by the Spirit of God. Well, he's just so-and-so, you know. It's one thing to speak against the person. But if you speak against the word that came from heaven, what did Jesus say in his day? You can speak against the Son of Man, it'll be forgiven you. But if you speak against the Holy Ghost, it'll never be forgiven you from the Spirit of God. So there's the danger. So did God speak from heaven? When did he start speaking? In 1963, God used a vessel of clay to open up six seals that still stands true today that can't be destroyed or defeated. It was not the man's intelligence or purpose or his disposure that was involved. God used a vessel of clay. Did not Jesus say to his disciples one day, they came to him, well, the Pharisee says that Elijah was to fulfill everything and John the Baptist didn't do it. And in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus says, yes, that was Elijah's to come. But Elijah shall come future and reveal or restore all things. And the trouble is today, if you go to any denomination, if, if that prophet is not from our denomination, we don't want to hear a thing. They cut everything off from, an, from a carnal mind. Not even want to look at what God is speaking with. In, so it would behoove us before we excuse the expression mouth off and say that's false you best know that it is that it is false that that voice is not God speaking to that vessel of clay to speak something it's best to yes maybe to, to put it on the shelf if you don't know but to say that's of the devil that's what those scribes and those Pharisees did to Jesus in their day. What was their outcome? Why couldn't they see it? They were educated like the educated theologian of today. The they knew the Torah in, inside out. But they couldn't recognize Jesus when he came. 
because they had got so regimental, so formal. In looking at God's word, they couldn't see it for the purity that it was. If Jesus would have came to those Pharisees and says, Thus saith the Lord, I say unto thee, they might have listened a bit. But he didn't come speaking that way to them at all. He just spoke the words, and they couldn't recognize the words that he that was coming from. So he said, the words that I speak, they're not mine. They're my father's. What part don't you understand? I mean, he didn't say that, but... He didn't say the part you don't understand. But it took an open heart like a child. A child doesn't preconceive and puts up barriers and says, well, okay, I'm going I'm to listen to what you say with these parameters that i got in my mind here. No. A child just is open. Yes, if something says wrong, after a while it says, well, yeah, Dad, you told me that the moon was made of grease cheese, and it's not. That's fine. You hear what I'm saying? So somewhere God is speaking. Somebody has to see it. Somebody has to know it. And somewhere it has that revelation that's been brought here in the end time has to stand. And not go by the way of the dodo bird. Not go by the way of the blood moons. The Jubilee. It's been 50 years since Israel became a nation, so the Jubilee is the year for release. So they jumped to the conclusion God's going to do something great last year, last September as well. There's all kinds of things that man has brought. Yes, those things are wrong. I remember, well, maybe in finishing off, before I, I got saved, there was that Jehovah Witness I was talking about, and he worked in the furnace room where I was working at the glass plant. And so I went in there one day and says, well, he says, it's going to happen. I said, what? He says, the end, the rapture's coming on February 28th, 1974. He believed it so much, he quit a high paying job just to wait for the Lord to come. Well, you're, you hear something like that being Catholic, you know nothing about the Bible. Ooh, okay, well, I don't know. <laughs> right? But came February the 29th. He was still here, and I was still here. A few years later, he had not abandoned that religion that told him that false revelation. They sweet-talked him. Well, it's not really what we meant and whether we've got, we, That's how they do the cover themselves when they say things that they promote prophecies that don't come to pass. It should be an indicator that's false. I must start waking myself and get getting the whole of the holes of, uh, ho, get a, a hold of the horns of the altar and looking, God, what is the truth? But no. And if you and as a person stays in that area where there was false, after a while, darkness sets in. You get accustomed to the darkness. And then we're just continuing on. I'm glad that God one day got a hold. Not through intellect, but his spirit made this world al word alive, real. Praise God. Yes, we're looking for that seventh seal to be broke. John was about to write what the thunders were going to say, and it was told, don't write them, because it's all, it's, no one is to know till the time Jesus breaks that seventh seal. When he does, what happens? He comes off that mercy seat. He will no longer be high priest. 
Now he's going to be coming king for the millennium. That means everyone's lost. That means no one will be added to the bride element. No more added to the white robes or foolish virgin element. Because he's off the mercy seat pleading for humanity. Now God can be gracious and pardon and give eternal life to whom he wants. Look at that thief on the cross. Did he say, well, I believe in Jesus Christ in your blood and everything and so forth? No. Jesus, because... He recognized who, that he was a righteous man. You will be this day with me in paradise. So therefore, God is sovereign in, in that manner. And most of the religious world don't understand the difference between fine linen and white robes. Fine linen and white robe both have the blood of Jesus Christ. White robes are saved. That's imputed to both groups. But the fine linen, my Bible tells me, you have to put it on. And what do we put on? Go to a shopping mall somewhere to get a nice fine linen dress? No. You put on the revelation of God that he has for the hour that dresses you. While those in white robes, all they want is, I love Jesus and I'm saved and that's fine. That's all they want to know. That's all they're capable of knowing. Because God knows their makeup. But the bride's going to be hungry. They're like little eaglets. I don't, you, I don't know about you, but if I, was, I remember being in that Catholic church. Yeah. yeah. Every four years, it'd be the same sermon. The same revelation they preached for thousands of years, nothing changed. It dries up, and spiritually, it's dead. What gives life is fresh, divine meat. If a move of God don't move with God in the next stage that God is moving into, they too will start to wean away in time and spiritual death kicks in. Take it loose at Martin Luther. He was on fire for God. Sure, he didn't believe a whole lot of things that we know today, or even what the apostles had. But God gave him the just shall live by faith. And the followers that followed him, oh yes, we believe the just shall live by faith. But they didn't believe Wesley that you must live a sanctified life. And so now it's just a cold denomination. They, oh, but we have the Word of God. We use the Word of God. Yes, from an intellectual point of view. But he's looking who is following him with this in the Spirit. And if he's using whatever, whether it's a church, whether it's servants, he expects an increase. He gave talents, five talents to one. He expected five more. Do you know who knows that laws of increase? real well. Your government, they keep increasing your taxes. They understand that part well. All right? I just thought I'd throw that in there. But they don't believe in God, necessarily. All right. Uh, maybe I've said for enough for, for this morning. There was other things that I wanted to touch, but I'll touch another time. But if you're not hungry... That don't mean every day I got to get something new. But somewhere surely in your lifetime, in your walk with God, there should be some opening up of some things, especially in this hour. Because this is the hour. For he that readeth and understandeth, God's opening things up. So praise the Lord. And there's no onus on the man that preaches because he's no better than you are because he has to get it from God Almighty. That's where he comes. And he can't crow, well, look what I got. No, no, it's not, your, it's not the preacher's revelation. It's the Lord's. All right, let's just stand at this time. I've said enough for this morning. Heavenly Father, as we look unto thee, Lord, I just pray, use the words that were spoken as you would see fit. Lord, you're the one that gives the increase. You're the one that leads. You're the one that supplies, Lord. 
the food in due season. I thank you, Lord, now in Christ Jesus' name I pray. Yeah. You can be seated. Have a musician to come. Someone still has a need, and we, we, you're welcome to come up to get prayed for. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Reach out and touch the Lord as He goes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your heart's cry. He's passing by this moment. You need to supply. Reach out. As he goes by, reach out and touch the Lord. As he goes by, you'll find he's not too busy to hear your heart's cry. He's passing by this moment.
Although we're living at the end time, Jesus is still on the throne of mercy. He's not left it yet. And I'm thankful, praise the Lord, He's given an opportunity. Let's just stand at this time. I'm going to ask Brother Gary Rishore to dismiss us in a word of prayer this morning. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. To pick them up and lift them up to a higher plane. Yes, mighty God. Lord, I pray this morning that for each member of your body, yes. Lord, that there is that hunger and that thirsting, that we are preparing ourselves to leave this world. For this world is not our home. Amen. And Lord, I pray you know every weakness. You know everything, oh God, concerning uh, your children today. Yes, Lord. And I pray, oh God, that we will submit ourselves, that we will commit ourselves. We will put our trust in Jesus Christ. Yes, Lord. And we will look to Him as the author and finisher of our faith. We thank you, Father, for the revelation, for the understanding that Thou hast given to us. Oh God, we love you. And we know that you love us. Yes, Lord. Because you gave thy only begotten Son. For God Amen, so Lord. loved the world that you died. Yes, Lord. And Jesus Christ died to set us free. Thank you, Lord. And I pray this morning, Father, for that precious among us, Lord, that is struggling, oh God, that you set his spirit free. Yes, Lord. For yes, thou hast come to set the captive free. Yes, Lord. Father, have your way in each and every heart, oh God. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Lord, bless each one. Dismiss till we meet again. Praise the Lord.